Uh, yeah, so everything is good. We'll just uh, let the participants come in and I'm like the breakout room is because I really wanted them working with each other. Um, yeah. but if there's a small enough group, we'll just play games in front of each other and I think it'll be okay. Yeah. Um, Danny, if you can hear me, can you set me up as a host so that um so I can share my screen later on. Hi, people. I can see that there's 17 participants, so I think there's probably people coming in with their videos off. Is that right? Yeah. Can you guys all turn your videos on? Oh, if they turn the videos on, then you'll lose... Uh... My, my, my prominence as the speaker. Yes, <laughs> I don't know because of the load that it puts on and the connections. Stephanie can maybe um, better store if that's an issue. Hey, Eileen, you should see a, sh a green share screen button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, that's I see that. Okay, so Perfect. you can share it. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. I can see that there's people in the room. I know I can't see your faces just yet, um, but thank you so much for joining us this little um, webinar session, advising session today. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a bit of chatting first and then later on we'll, we'll turn on your cameras and we'll let you guys introduce yourselves to each other. So that'll, that'll be in the next little bit. Okay, great. So shall we start? It's 9.07. Um, the director's in the room and she's already <laughs> taking us in through the plan. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third day of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. I'm Amina Yakin. I'm the director of the festival and it's a pleasure to connect with you all and to welcome you to this masterclass with our, <clears throat> our wonderful theatre director, Aileen Conant. It's a theatre masterclass in devising, um, non-hierarchical theatre making as a tool of disruption. And I'm going to just give you a brief introduction to Aileen, who is um, a Japanese American director with a passion for daring new works of theater that engage audiences with untold and undertold stories in a visual, visceral way. Her Colchester based physical company, Theater Temoir, is a, um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, one degree East Portfolio Lowry developed with and without walls portfolio company and has worked in collaboration with the Salisbury Playhouse, Oval House, Roundhouse, GDIF and others. Eileen has worked for various companies in the UK, including the Bush Theatre, Yellow Earth and Theatre 503. She has uh, received awards twice from the Wellcome Trust with a rigorous approach to how she has a rigorous approach to community engagement and research. And uh, my screen is uh, showing her trailer. Are we can can we sort of just uh, hold on to that for a minute? And um, she's worked freelance for various companies in the UK, including Bush Theatre, Yellow Earth and Theatre 503 to repeat. <laughs> she's a twice recipient of the Welcome Trust People Award with a rigorous approach to community engagement and research. She's a board member of Stage Directors UK and a delegate member of Artistic Directors of the Future. And she is somebody who is working towards greater equality and inclusion and integrity in the UK theatre industry. I've um, got to know her over the last few years and uh, the energy and uh, ideas. It's, she is a buzzing theatre director and I think if I were ever to write a play, I would definitely want it to be directed by Aileen, although I'm not sure she would want to direct it. <laughs> but uh, um, <clears throat> I think you're in for a treat. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Thank you, Aileen. We are so grateful to you for doing this and I'll hand over to you. Brilliant. Um, I just want to say good morning again, and I just want to thank you all for coming at nine o'clock on a, a whatever morning it is, Wednesday morning. Um, 
Um, as you guys can all see, I'm, um, in, I'm in a beautiful church. This is the parish church of St. Barnabas in Bethnal Green. And they do, this is a hot tip. Don't tell anyone. They do rehearsal space for 90 quid a day in this enormous hall. And right now what I'm working on is I'm working on a piece that has a Japanese taiko drummer. So you can see all those music instruments back there. And um, a wushu weapons specialist. So we've got a bunch of weapons and we're doing this kind of... Uh, East Asian women, amazing Japanese myth thing. Um, so that's that's kind of my context and to explain why I've got all this, uh, these amazing windows behind me. Um, in terms of what I wanted to talk about today and just to kind of let you know how the session will go, I see some, a little bit of, a, <laughs> a little bit of um, anxiety in the chat in terms of like, oh God, if we turn our cameras on, what happens to the recording? Um, like I said in the, in the, in the introduction of the session, the way that I work is that I, I get groups of people together, getting to know each other. It's actually very unusual for me to be talking to a bunch of people without uh, you know, getting to know you first. Very unusual for me to be doing it without seeing your names or faces or anything. So what I wanna say is feel free to use the chat space in, um, in this space here to, as, as kind of a community space, just to say hi, say who you are, um, and maybe even put in the chat what you might be interested in learning today in terms of devising and what your background is. Because I don't even know if I'm dealing with like majority theater students or majority literature students, like I don't know what your backgrounds are and I really wanna make this session work for you. So go ahead and stick that in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, so one, one of the things I wanted to, basically the, the theme for today is disruptive theater, which is a bit of a, um, it's, it's kind of a buzzword, isn't it? Disruption. Um, and it is a little bit of a misnomer, I'd say, um, just in, in the sense that there's nothing sort of aggressive about the type of disruption that I'm talking about. Um, I think that there's something inherently disruptive about, about coming into a context and, and breaking down the hierarchy so that you are effectively making everybody equal in a space. There's something inherently disruptive about that. Um, you can even see it doesn't, it doesn't work with a webinar, for example, right? So the structures that are already in place, it, it, they don't work with this idea of like everybody non-hierarchical like that. That's just in our society, there's hierarchy everywhere. And so the kind of theater that I do often, um, if I go into a space where say there's uh, NHS uh, care workers in a mental health hospital and, um, you know, service users, for example. If I go into that space with a non-hierarchical attitude and I go, who are you, who are you, who are you? And what does everybody here have to teach to everybody else and learn from everybody else? There's something inherently disruptive about that. And I think that's what I've found um, in the different contexts that I've gone to when I work, um, in, especially in post-conflict settings. So I know I'm, this is a million miles a minute. I think just to give you kind of a flavor of what I do, I'm gonna play a very short video um, which just is the last project I happened to do in Northern Ireland. Um, so we'll watch that and then I'll show you a kind of a PowerPoint with a couple of my shows. Um, and then we'll get into the kind of the more collaborative kind of Q and A and uh, getting to know each other. And then we'll make something of our own, whatever that means. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and load up that video. Nobody has grieved in this province yet. Nobody can accept anything because they haven't grieved. We're still in shock. We were dealing with bomb explosions, dealing with a lot of incendiary attacks. And that was mixed in amongst all of the routine, if you can call it that. When people say that it was a dirty war, God, it was a dirty war. I just knew that it was my time to tell my story. We had removed casualties are still living, and we were gone. You never actually saw a paramedic or an ambulance being interviewed. Many of my contemporary colleagues were taken before their time through a variety of things from depression to PTSD to cancer, and there aren't that many of us left. Northern Ireland is like one of the highest rates of suicide among young men. A lot of that comes from what happened in the past and looking at the past and what we can learn from it and then bringing that into today. Are these yours? Some of them? 
What's inside them? Not sure how to explain. Can we open them? It's probably best to leave it. Why? Oh, I want to see what's inside. Wait. What's in that one? I was talking to my sister earlier on, and it was almost like for years she lived with like a, a box under the bed with like dirty washing on it. Every now and again, you sort of make the bed and it takes out from under the bed and you kick it back in again because it's not something you want to think about or talk about. And this is almost like opening a box and taking it and shaking it out and even talking it through and talking to other people about it. I've just found that really, really very positive and therapeutic. In a, in a very practical sense. We didn't get counselling uh, and therefore you had to put the individual uh, trauma parts into boxes in your head. Anytime I was interviewed on the television about my stories, I kept saying that and I hope that I gave her the idea that maybe she had it in the first place. In order to create a narrative that has meaning, right, I needed to do something poetic or transposed or non-literal in order to kind of bring seven people together into one story. I'm sitting there going, who's the protagonist? Well, clearly the ensemble. Then who's the antagonist? Their memories? We're in a way revealing the people, persons, individuals, and listen to what the drama students are telling us. We were doing the crying in December angry with each other, storming out. And they started crying just one week ago, the young people. And that was because they suddenly began thinking, what were their parents doing at that time? Our family, we never really talk about it. It's something that I never really even thought about in the early rehearsals. It was almost like a big blur. And you were just like, wow, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> But over time, we start to learn, you know, about the past, you know, what, what it was actually like. And it's also, like, reflects on the society that we live in. When we told them our stories, they'd never heard of them before. I feel that their generation needs to hear our stories so that they will never get involved in anything like that again. It moved from the young people being some sort of signing board for us to bounce stories off to an actual real conversation starting. For them to start to open up and share their experience with the difficulties that young people are facing today. A lot of the first responders have mental health issues because of the troubles. They have PTSD and depression and flashbacks. They don't have that, but we still have anxiety and mental health issues. And I think a lot of young people are still anxious about Protestants and Catholics and the divide between that. And they start they're pleading with us for the stories. We tell them stories, and then the, you know, their attitudes change a little bit. You know, do they want to hear any more? But yet the boxes keep coming. You could walk down any street in any town in Northern Ireland and walk past someone who's suffered more trauma than we have. And I think the conclusion we came to was, at the end of the day, you can only tell your story. And if something comes out of that, and people can learn from it. Well, that has to be a positive thing, I suppose. It's not about war stories now. They've all been recorded. It's about what we have done or what we have left for the next generation. The very real challenges that they face, which I think are every bit as serious as the ones we face, probably more so, and how we can help them deal with them and the insight and perspective they can still give us onto the life we led. These workshops, this play is not going to solve the problems. But what we can do is listen to each other's stories. What we can do is agree that we can live with difference. That is Northern Ireland today. You know, there's lots of realities, differing realities. Divisions across the path cut deep into woods. This is her turn to call Storm the Watch. Shatter the glass and break the binding chain. There's a lot of people out there haven't told their children. Well, you don't need all the gory bits. You need to know something about it to make better decisions in the future. And they are our future. What happened was awful. Like, it was absolutely horrible. But at the end of the day, as well as that, we have to learn from it. And we need to take what we can from that.
And I think, you know, especially now there is kind of a focus on young people in mental health today, which is really, really important. If there was one feeling that came from it, it was the delight that the audience got it. They knew what we were doing. They knew why we were trying to do it and they reacted to it. And it stimulated people. It had made them think they had engaged with it. They had empathised with it. It worked. It was like a family. You know, and we have connected. We really have. We've, they've cried with us and uh, they've, they've accepted us. unmute myself so that's um that's just a little a little kind of uh, really kind of brief introduction to some of the kinds of stuff so that was a participatory project um i also work with professional actors but whenever i do that i do try to make sure that there's a real participatory element to the work that i'm doing so i might be bringing for example i did a piece um of theater that was about a boy who was experiencing homelessness and it was a mask theater piece um, but I made sure that the actors were working in hostels and working with people with experience of homelessness and getting kind of almost trained um, by experts who had lived experience and sort of the first run of the show would always be going into homeless sector hostels or going into recovery colleges before we took the show out um, into kind of more traditional theater spaces. So that's, that's kind of... Um, yeah, that's a bit about about the work. Um, here's another. I'm just really, really quickly going to share my screen um, and show a couple of uh, other projects that are the international projects. And again, a lot of these are the participatory ones that I've done. So can everyone, is everybody seeing this? Um, so this is um, just running through some of the projects that I've done. This particular project was um, working in Lebanon. I have a question. Can, can people see my, my pointer? Or is that because I? So I'll, I'll actually just name them, just so that you know where we are. So, a drop of honey was a project that we did in Lebanon, and we were working with um, uh, major kind of uh, commanders from opposing sides of the Lebanese civil conflict. And what they did was they created kind of a, a database of stories from the the past, and then working with young people, we created kind of a farce around that. I mean, I say farce, like kind of a. a a comedy about Lebanese civil society, but, but drawing kind of grounded in these really real stories so that we were always going back to, this isn't a joke, this isn't a joke. Um, in Jammu and Kashmir, um, that was an interesting one because that was a, a, that was a context that was not really a post-conflict context, it was really a current conflict context. And so a lot of the projects that were there were less about processing something that was past, and it was actually more about, uh, in a way protecting from what was going on now. So a lot of the projects that were there were, 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 were not so conflict focused that were much more kind of, um, yeah, yeah, working on, on things like dreams and just working in joy and working in play and working to access that in a space that was, that was quite heavy. Um, in, in Rwanda, I worked with a group of young, um, I say young men, they were children. They were between the ages of sort of 13, 12 and I think the oldest was maybe 19. So they were all young people who had been demobilized from fighting in the Congo, who had originally been Rwandan before the sort of, um, before they escaped after the genocide. So this would have been, this would have been young people who, who didn't fit into the national narrative. So the, the conflict in Rwanda, there was um, obviously a, a, a massacre um, against the Tutsi, but the people who were, the, the, there was a big population of Hutus who after that kind of ran away to the Congo. And then what's not, what's a little bit less known is that there were counter, you know, counter attacks. Um, and I'm not saying one side better than the other or anything like that, but these children, their experience was that a lot of them lost family, a lot of them lost their parents very, very young, and then were kind of left alone or kidnapped or taken into a context where they became child soldiers um, and were being repatriated into a country um, Rwanda, where they were actually the enemy in terms of the national narrative there. They were, they were the, bad, the bad kids, you know, so their kind of suffering didn't fit within the, 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 the larger kind of narrative frame. And that was a really interesting project because then when you go and you go, okay, what I'm fundamentally going to do is go, what's your story? And your story has value within this context where it might not hierarchically necessarily fit. Um, there's something inherently 
disruptive about that. Um, there's a really amazing group of young people. Um, and then um, these two projects. So again, this is an interesting one. So in, in, in Israel, when I worked in Israel, I was there for a very, very short period of time. And for me personally, I had just come off the back of working in um, uh, Lebanon. I had been, so for me, it, it felt, on my journey, it felt important to engage with the IDF. And that was kind of the reason that I was there. Um, and what happened was that I kind of, first made contact with a group of older veterans from a disabled veterans center called Bet al -Hem. And a lot of these guys had like lost legs and arms and eyes in, in the wars of the, the 70s. Um, and then obviously while I was there, I was also meeting a very um, important group of young politicized men who were from Breaking the Silence and you know organizations that were very um, engaged in the, the, the current political narrative and conversation around Israel policy. And what was really interesting about that project was I, I kind of had to make a decision. There was one story, which was sort of the like trauma narrative, which is here's my own personal issues and here's how I dealt with it and here's me recovering from trauma. And then there's this whole socio-political piece, which is very important um, in the context, but it was almost like I didn't have the time to do that justice and to throw those two things together in a way that would have been, uh, that would have honored the original participants that I interviewed, like it would have been a bit two dimensional or a bit, it would have, it would have, it, I didn't have the time and the space. And so I made the decision not to do that, which I, I wanted to bring that example up because I think there's something inherently political also about who you choose to work with and who you don't work with. And that within that context, making the decision to exclusively work with one group was a, it was a, it, it was a politically difficult decision. It was very difficult for me. Um, and it was disruptive as well in its, in its own way. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that if questions come up. Um, the caravan is a piece that was working with Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Right now, 25% of the population of Lebanon is Syrian refugees. So there's a real tension there. They, none of them have passports. They're really restricted in terms of where they can move. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resentment from the local population. So what we did was we took um, we took a group and, and got their stories and their voices and then created a sort of interactive piece of street theater where they go out and share the stories and then have a dialogue with, um, with the, the audiences who were predominantly Lebanese. Um, and what was, again, interesting about that is kind of working in those kinds of contexts, you have to be making like you talk about health and safety, like you have to, there were, there was a moment where we kind of had to pull half of the tour because a big bomb had gone off and like, you know, people were blaming the Syrian population. It was, it was physically dangerous for our performers to be going out and putting themselves in that situation. So I think it's really interesting because whenever that happens, you kind of grind to a halt. And I think that there's something inherently sort of, I want to say almost imperialistic about going, oh, we're the ones who are going to make the decisions about the health and safety. Like the conclusion that we came to was we need to go to the cast and go, what do you guys want to do? Um, and yeah, in the end, I think that that was the big piece of learning there was that the most important, there's sometimes you're doing art in insane situations and there is no, there's no safety and there's no right and wrong. And actually it's less about what conclusions you come to and it's more about who you include in that conversation and how you come to them. So that I'm going to pause there because I could kind of ramble for ages, but I'm, I'm aware that I'm kind of covering a lot of broad areas. Um, it would be lovely to kind of get to see your faces and to kind of move into um, a section where we're kind of now uh, chatting a little bit more openly and maybe do a QA. and a um, Is that something, we, somebody had a very, very good suggestion, which was that people might be uncomfortable turning on their cameras. Um, and what we could do is we could just stop the recording because it was for archive purposes only. Would people be more comfortable um, doing that if we could, if we stopped the if we stopped recording at this point. So, great. It's good to see your videos coming online. Can I just so, you, say, I, I, not to interrupt you, I was just going to say the Q&A feature is there as well. And I think it allows people to say things anonymously if they don't want to say something uh, by, by identifying themselves. So perhaps that's something that they could also use. Oh yeah, um, it, it, I, I think that if we're if the eventual goal is for us to create something together, it's very difficult for me to imagine what that looks like if we're not engaging with one another. So I think eventually we'll want to kind of see each other's faces and be able to hear each other anyway. So I, it would be great if we could just get that going now. 
I'm really happy to do that straight away. Ah, oh, it's good to see you guys. Hi. God, that was a really weird experience for me. I was just talking into a vacuum. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, would really, I would really love the recording to stop because I know that these things can be used in ways that we haven't consented to. Um, yeah. And just the idea of hierarchical theory.